It's my pleasure today to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Björn Brems. He came over from Berlin today. Uh, Björn started his career in Würzburg with Martin Heisenberg, where he was working on Drosophila and already on operant conditioning, which has been a red thread to his whole research career. He then went on to make a postdoc in Houston in Jack Burns Group on a different preparation in Aplesia, but still in operant conditioning. And then he came back uh, two years ago, now to Berlin uh, with uh, Randolph Menzel, where he's still, uh, or again, working on Drosophila and op operant conditioning. And today he's going to tell us a story about learning by doing in the fruit fly, Drosophila. And I'm looking forward to find out what that's about. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, I've been planning to come and visit for the longest time. So I was really, really happy and grateful uh, for Thomas with the, when he invited me here and provided me this opportunity to uh, have a look around the campus and visit the diverse groups and people that are working here. And uh, so far, the few hours I've been here, I've thoroughly enjoyed my stay. So thanks a lot. Um, before I go into um, the background on, on learning by doing and those things, I'll, I thought I'll start with something that's very, very general and that, that most people that are interested in neuroscience should be, should, are probably going to be well aware of. Um, and that is that our brain, and brains in general, are energeti energetically extremely costly organs. Um, so for example, the brain makes up only 2% of a person's weight, but it consumes, even at rest, 20% of the body's energy. And for newborns, it's even higher, it's even up to 75%. So that means that the brain consumes energy at about 10 times the rate of the rest of the body per gram of tissue. Um, actually, the, this energy consumption has, has been so large that it's thought that uh, the brain size was actually limited by, or mostly limited by the energy supply that the organisms um, were able to uh, supply the brain with. Now, so one obvious question is if it's so expensive and we have to make it larger and larger, where does all that energy go? What's the brain doing with all this energy? And uh, very recently, uh, Marcus Reichel in published um, a paper in Science on uh, resting activity in the human brain, and uh, later also in monkeys. Mm -hmm. And what he showed, what you can see here, is patterns of correlated activity in the human brain at rest. People call uh, these structures the default network, and uh, Marcus Reichel in this article said something that I thought uh, was very interesting, namely that the energy burden associated with the environment may be as little 0.5 or 1% of the total energy budget, meaning that these spontaneous, the spontaneous activity consumes about 99% of the brain's energy. And whenever then the people in the, in the fMRI uh, are asked to perform a task, there's not, the, the energy demand of the brain doesn't rise more than about half a percent or a percent. So uh, computing tasks and, and handling uh, and processing stimuli from the environment apparently uh, only takes about 0.5 or 1% of the brain's total energy budget. So of course it's a very uh, obvious question, what could, um, uh, what could be so important about this spontaneous activity? And just uh, about a month or two ago, uh, the Reichel group again was able to correlate these um, these spontaneous activity patterns with spontaneous behavioral variability. So that um, uh, the people were asked to uh, do a, a button press task, and the force with which they pressed the button varied according to uh, the variability in the brain's spontaneous patterns. So then, of course, the, the question then is, what could be so important about this sort of spontaneity, about this active behavior that uh, you find in the brain. And then this now leads me to an idea that people have had for a very long time for what activity and active behavior and spontaneity could be important for. And um, this was about uh, 100 to 120 years ago um, in his famous uh, textbook, Principles of Psychology from 1890. 1890, uh, William James writes that a curious peculiarity of our memory is that things are impressed better by active than by passive repetition. And we all know that from, from introspection, that if once we've done things ourselves, we'll, we know them much better than if we just uh, perceive them. 
Uh, this idea was popularized, popularized uh, a couple of years later by uh, the founder of the Scout Movement, uh, Robert Baden Powell, uh, in, his, in his famous uh, book, Scouting for, for Boys. And uh, he said, and that is probably not in the book, but the quote uh, is very enlightening uh, in how he was pushing uh, his idea, and that's, that's, he coined the term of learning by doing. And that our educationalists over here are now recognizing that our principle of encouraging active doing on the part of the individual instead of passive reception of ideas by the mass is practical as an education as opposed to theoretical instruction. Now, today, um, people realize that um, uh, today's psychologists, um, they call this, the, the, this general effect underlying learning by doing the generation effect. It, the term was coined by Slameka and Graf's uh, landmark paper from 1978, where they showed that if you generate the word psychoneuroendocrinology from a fragment just like this one, you'll remember it better than if you just read the word without actually having to do anything about it. And that's why um, this effect is called the generation effect, because you have to actively generate the word rather than just passively read it. Um, later, uh, several years later, almost 30 years later, um, uh, Cornell and Terrace found the same effect in monkeys. So when monkeys can figure out themselves which button to press and also which button not to press, which image not to press, so are allowed to make mistakes, they learn the task much better and remember it much, much longer uh, than if they're just shown which buttons they're supposed to press and which they're not supposed to press. Uh, this is reminiscent of an effect um, that in my graduate studies I found in flies. So in flies you can actually teach a couple of things. Uh, one of them is, for example, to distinguish an upright from an inverted T as visual patterns. Um, so you can actually teach them just as the monkeys, they do learn it, it just takes them longer. So you can teach the flies to distinguish between this upright and inverted T, so those performance indices uh, are a measure for how well the flies have learned. And uh, this is, uh, so you can see they do distinguish between the two, the two patterns by simply presenting one pattern and then punishing them with a heat beam, for example, and then presenting the next pattern and, and not punishing them. So the animals can learn that. However, if they're allowed to explore themselves to find out what is punished and what not, uh, they learn this in about half the time and to about, and about uh, twice the level. Um, so now, in order to study this, um, one would try to start to dissect and think about what are the components of this system and then interfere with these components biologically or experimentally or in, <coughs> in another way, uh, experimentally, and then find out um, where this effect may come from. So if you look at um, this simple learning, what you have is you have the stimulus and you have the heat as a reinforcer that uh, instructs the animal as to uh, one pattern being good and another pattern, be pattern being bad. In this case, the only, you always you also have the stimulus and the reinforcer. You know, one is good, one is bad, depending on how I set up the heat. But I also have, on top of that, I have the behavior with which the flies uh, control those stimuli. So what you can say is that you have you know, that the stimulus is one component and uh, stimulus and behavior are two components. Um, you might, um, if you say that this is active and this is a passive component um, or this is a passive procedure, this is, would be the passive procedure and this would be what we would call the active procedure. However, um, this active procedure Basically, just as this one, because uh, here also the word is the, the, the reading is also involved. Um, whereas the active is not categorically different; it just adds something to the same task. So, it con the active, what we would call an active uh, form of learning, consists of both active and passive components. Now, how can we set up an experiment to do this? Um, to Maybe introduce you a little bit, uh, a little bit deeper into this, because this is very important um, for the remainder of the talk. Into this concept of uh, components in in a, a composite task, 
um, you can see that most situations that animals face, be it flies or be it, be it any other animals or humans, is that the animals produce some sort of behavior. The behavior has an effect on the perceived environment. So in, in the case of the flies, it would be the patterns and the heat. And usually there are certain relationships in the environment. And those are very often called uh, classical relationships, or, or it's, a, it's a fact learning procedure that the animals learn that the, uh, the upright T, for example, is punished and the inverted T isn't, or whatever other visual cues we can use. You will see that flies can learn other things too. So that would be a passive component, or you would call it also a classic component because it's very reminiscent of uh, a task that you all know when Pavlov's dog is learning this relationship between two environmental stimuli. Um, and then in this, in this uh, scheme of things, you'd say that this would be uh, an operant relationship and that the behavior controls whether or not the heat is being switched on or off or not, or, or um, whether or not the animal is being punished or rewarded or something. Uh, this would obviously be the active form of learning. And uh, the iconic paradigm for that, of course, is uh, the Skinner box and the, the rat pressing the lever. And if you've been able to follow me so far, if I haven't lost you yet, um, then you'll see that the, the same problem exists here that exists in almost all preparations in that you can perceive this also as a situation which has operant and classical or, or fact and skill components in that the, the press lever signals food just as the bell signals food for the dog. And the technical problem that the people working on, on rats and mice are having is that you can't take the lever away. So you can effectively isolate the behavior and t you know, take the behavior out uh, by simply restraining the animal. That's exactly what Pavlov did. And you know, just the, have it just passively receive those two stimuli. Whereas in this sit setup, if you take the lever away, there's, there's nothing for the animal to do. So if you want to separate the effects of active and passive components, of fact and skill learning components on learning, uh, you're in trouble if you if you use uh, this sort of standard learning paradigm. And I'll try to uh, convince you that there's a good way to do this in flies, and that we can f get find stuff out in flies that you can't, or have, uh, or is it a lot more, at least a lot more difficult to do uh, with vertebrates such as uh, rats and mice. So. Again, you, can, you could call this because it's composed of two components, an operant skill learning component and a classical fact learning component. You call, could call this composite conditioning or composite learning. Um, I'll try to stick, or I, I do stick to the, um, to the color scheme here that um, anything that has to do with the behavior, with the skill will be green. Anything to do with the environment, the facts that the animals learn will be blue and then anything that comprises both of these components will be red. So, how did we do this? Um, we use stationary flying flies. So they have a drop of glue in the, between the head and the thorax, and then uh, in this drop of glue is fixed, which is hard to see here, is a, a little hook, and then a clamp to hold the hook and to uh, tether the fly. You see that the fly is doing all kinds of things. It's moving its abdomen, its legs, even its uh, antennae. And if you uh, put the clamp into something called a torque meter, you can measure uh, a bunch of things depending on what you put into this torque meter. But in this case, you measure the tendency of the fly, its attempts to turn left or right. So if you, if you look at what kind of data you can record, uh, what you see is that uh, the fly is turning left and right. So this is, uh, is sped up, obviously. This is 30 minutes, a 30 minute experiment. And this is yaw torque. So somewhere in the middle would be flying straight ahead. And you see that um, the fly changes flight direction uh, seemingly randomly from left to right, basically all over the entire uh, 30 minutes. Um, we have recently published a paper on a mathematical analysis um, of the time structure, the temporal structure uh, of this behavior. And um, what this analysis suggests is that this is not a random, uh, a random alternation between left and right turning, but that this is actually something that's generated spontaneously by the brain, which looks very random, but is actually a, a complex combination of, of nonlinearity and, and noise. <coughs>
Um, so in order to provide the animal with something to learn, we give it a, an environment, uh, which is this, this, this arena. The, the arena can be lit either in white or if we use a uh, color filter here or two color filters, we can illuminate it in different colors. Other, otherwise, other than that, there are no, no uh, visual features. So in this case, we won't use patterns. We'll use colors to train the animals. And I hope uh, it's not too confusing to you that uh, the colors are green and blue. That has nothing to do with behavior or, uh, uh, or fact learning. It's that those are just the, uh, the patterns, the colors that, you, uh, that are uh, convenient to use for the color spectrum that the animal can perceive. Um, and then to provide an incentive for the animals to actually learn something as a reinforcer or as a, as a punisher, we use an infrared laser diode which heats the fly up. So for example, if the fly is attempting to turn right, which is denoted here by you know, roughly the middle was straight ahead, so if the fly is turning to the right, we switch the heat off uh, and we turn the arena green. And if the fly is attempting to turn to the left, and remember it's not turning, we really only uh, record its attempts to do that. The fly itself is stationary, as you've seen in the video. Um, we switch the heat on and uh, turn the arena to blue. So now what you have is you have this, this situation again where um, you have the colors and the yaw torque, in this case so the torque of around its vertical body axis, the behavior of the animal, uh, which are controlling the heat in a, in a uh, classical or fact learning way and in an operant or skill learning way. So now you have possibility to experimentally separate the two components. Now how do we evaluate the data? Um, we use uh, performance indices. If they're minus one, it means that the flight chose to spend the time, the entire time in the punished situation. If it's plus one, it spent the, time, the entire uh, period in the unpunished situation. And that means, of course, that if it's zero, the flight uh, did not have a specific preference for a certain yaw torque range or color. And uh, those bars are always two minute bars, so th th every period is two minutes long. So these flies almost spent one minute in the punished situation and one minute in the later unpunished situation. Um, training means that the laser can be switched on if the right situation arises, the fly chooses the, um, the punished situation. And uh, yellow means there's no um, punishment at all, and it's just a, a choice of the, or a spontaneous choice um, test for the fly. So you see that once we switch the heat on, the flies avoid the heat very quickly, and also even when the heat is switched off, they still avoid the punished situation. And now of course the question is, are they avoiding the punished behavior, or are they avoiding the punished color? Um, we'll, for, to, to, ana to analyze uh, these processes, uh, we'll, look al we'll always look at the uh, first training, af as, at the first test period after the last training, which is marked here as, as performance index 8. That's the one we're going to look at for the remainder of the talk. Now, we just plot that again. Again, as I said, in red, because here we have both the color and the behavior of the fly. Uh, that's why in red, the composite situation, it's just this bar plotted again here. It's just the same thing. So in order to find out, um, actually let me back up a second. So we already know that for the patterns, if we have the patterns alone, the passive pattern learning, then uh, this is working, uh, or the learning takes longer and isn't as effective uh, as if you have both the color, uh, both the cue, the external cue, and the behavior together. So now what you want to see, and this is basically the same here as well, but now what we want to see is if the symmetrical question is also right. So if I take only the behavior without the colors, does that also lead to a decrease in learning, such that I have the behavior alone, and I have, actually I should do it the other way around, so I have the behavior alone, and I have the colors alone, and they should be lower if it were a symmetrical effect, then both together in the composite situation. So we take, this is very simple, we take the color filter out, so the animals don't have the color cue anymore, and do the same experiment. What, what we find is that the animals can actually learn that. Uh, this is both significant, in this case, the difference is not significant, but I can show um, using a slightly altered um, 
training regime that this is actually a significant difference, even though uh, statistically this here is not significant. If I, what I did is I reduced the training and then the difference becomes significant. So I, get, I, have the symmetric, I have the symmetrical situation in that the two components yield a lower learning score than both components together. And what could be more straightforward now than to hypothesize, well, they two add up. They, have a, they learn something about the colors, they learn something about the behavior, and then you know, both of them yield a higher learning score. That's very straightforward. So the question is, is, is there a summation going on? Um, to, do, to test this hypothesis, um, ideally you just want to knock one of the components out and see how does uh, the behavior, how does the learning pan out. And um, what you do in Drosophila is you use mutants. In this case, you use the Rutabaga mutant, which is a very well-known mutant. It's basically been, been a mutant in any learning paradigm that uh, has been thrown at the animals. And uh, what would you expect? So what, what is not known, though, is, is if this behavioral learning if is affected in this mutant. So there's two options, basically. So if the mutation, the Rutabaga mutation, only knocks out the classical component, the, the color learning component, which we know is uh, the case, if it only knocks that one out, then you expect something sort of like this, because then only the, the behavioral learning remains. However, if the, the, the Rutabaga mutants are just stupid, they don't learn anything, then you'd expect zero for both experiments. However, what we find is something very different. We find, for one, that this is the first time that Rutabaga is wild type and learning anything, so they learn very well the behavioral task. Actually, uh, we can show that it learns it better than wild type. However, the more surprising thing is actually that there's no learning score here because, remember, this differs only from this one by taking the color filter out. So if the animals had eyelids, all they would have to do is close their eyes and then they should do fine. So you have some sort of dominant negative effect of the colors over the behavioral learning. And so the first thing that we showed was that it's not the colors themselves, just flickering colors, why they learn this kind of behavioral task does not confuse them. So it's not something trivial in that the flies get easily confused by... Can I ask yes. you quickly, the Wutabaga, they are completely blind or are they color blind? No, what? they're not even blind. They're just learning mutants. They can see the colors oh, just fine. Everything? Yes, okay. they can see just fine. So the, they have no sensory problems whatsoever, not that I know of. And um, so for example, they fly straight ahead if you give them a visual panorama. So they, they have no visual acuity is fine. And despite that their visual acuity is absolutely wild type, they also they don't learn those patterns, for example. So this is not restricted to the colors. This is really it's a very general thing that Basically, every and olfaction is the same thing. They've been usually initially uh, identified as olfactory mutants, that they don't learn uh, smells, even though they can distinguish the smells. So it's a very specific mutation for learning, and apparently, it's a very specific mutation for classical conditioning. Um, so it's not trivial that the colors just confusing them. The colors are just confusing them. So then, what you want to find out to be able to understand what is actually going on is you want to find out at what level does this interference, this dominant negative interference take place. Are the animals here learning the behavior but they can't show it because the animal, the, the, the colors are there? Or are the colors preventing any learning from occurring at all? So is it a retrieval or is it a, an acquisition deficit? And you do this fairly easily uh, experimentally by simply having the standard uh, training here with colors and behavior at the same time, and then after training, so in this case we did the whole procedure without the color filters, but now after the color and behavior training we take the color filter out. Then of course if, um, if there's the level of acquisition, is the, if the interference is at the level of acquisition, there should be nothing left, right, because they never even learn anything. Whereas if they did learn something here, they just couldn't show it. It couldn't show it if we leave the colors there. Then we should get a positive learning score, and this is exactly what we find. So there's interference of the colors at the level of retrieval. When the colors are there, they do learn that left turning is punished, for example, but they can't show that if the colors are there. Now the interesting thing is actually if you look at the wild type flies, the control flies they show an interference at the level of acquisition. So if you can learn the colors, 
then this learning prevents you from learning about your behaviors. And that makes a lot of sense because that's all you need. Once you know green is punished, you can, you know, that's all you need to know. You don't need to know that it's left turning or right turning. Um, so what, you, what we have here to sum, sum this up is retrieval, a retrieval deficit in the mutant flies and an acquisition interference or, or inhibition um, for the wild type flies. So this was done by uh, isolating the operand component, right, the skill learning component, simply by taking this classical component, taking the fact learning component away. Um, so to sum this up, we have a composite learning situation with a skill learning component, which uh, you could call an active component or an operand component. There's clearly the operand has a problem with the nomenclature here, obviously, because operand usually means, in the general term, means um, this sort of lever pressing thing, which is always something that's composed of, of several components. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to refrain from using operand or classical. It, it'll, it'll still, because so after so many years, it's just ingrained. But um, I'll try for the rest of the talk to, to refrain from using operand and classical because it's not really a very adequate nomenclature. Um, and what we found out is that uh, that we already we already knew that the fact learning component is rooted value dependent, and what we but we found out that it's the skill learning component here is rooted value independent. Now, what we also learned is that the fact learning component inhibits the skill learning component. And it's at the level of retrieval in the mutants, but at the level of acquisition in the wild type flies. What that means, though, is that we said that <coughs> putting both together leads to enhanced learning. So it's really counterintuitive that one of the first interactions that we find is actually an inhibition. That, means that, that leads us, we must postulate some sort of facilitation that works in the other way. Otherwise, you would never get an augmentation. You'd never get an enhancement of learning. So we know a little bit now about the biological substrate of those two components. What could be the biological substrate of this inhibition and this facilitation? And for that, uh, it's good to keep in mind this idea that all I have to learn is the colors because then I can use uh, any behavior to choose between the colors and not just the one I've learned it with. Because this is, this is where I'm going to go now. Um, and so what this might, actually to back up here, what this might actually do, it means that I learn this very, very fast, faster than if I had only this uh, fact learning component, and it's independent of what I learned it with. It means I can handle my knowledge, my facts, I can handle them independently, I can generalize them. And uh, this generalization uh, is tested by uh, changing the behavior, so allowing the flies to use a different behavior to access the fact knowledge that they have gained. Uh, this is done uh, first by training them in this standard, you know, left and right turning, green and blue uh, mode in this composite situation, and this is just showing that the training here in orange works fine, and then the control flies, and then you transfer a proportion of the flies that have been trained like this after the training in a different situation. And this is, you have to imagine this is sort of like a flight simulator now, in that you have four identical stripes in the environment of the fly, and now we feed back the yaw torque, the turning movements of the fly, the left and right turning attempts, by turning the arena. So if the fly tries to turn to the right, we turn the arena to the left, so that the fly gets the impression that it actually turned, by simply changing the visual in, uh, impression. Uh, and when the fly is flying, let's say, towards these two stripes, the arena is green, and if it's flying towards the other two stripes, we'll make the arena blue. And so we switch the colors right between uh, two stripes. So this means that here, the flies have to turn, 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 turn to keep the arena green, whereas here, the fly has to fly straight, straight, straight to keep the arena green. So basically what it has to do is to do the opposite of what it has been doing during training all along. And if we do that, uh, we see that the flies show no preference for any of the um, any of the color if, of the two colors. Um, this might be discouraging, but if you what is very very usual a usual procedure in these cases is that you give them a brief reminder training um, by simply for a very brief period of time, let's say 60 seconds, um, 
punishing them on the previously punished color, simply to tell them, okay, this is still the same situation. This is something that's, that's done very com that's very common. And what you find then is you find um, a nice generalization, significant generalization score. So in this case, now what we've done is we've isolated this classical component by replacing the behavior. So now we have the possibility of isolating each of the two components, look at it in isolation, and uh, perform some biological manipulations with the fly and see what happens. And uh, since this is, as I said, is a, oops, since I said this is a, a generalization task, because the flies generalize the colors from one behavior to the next, people working in Drosophila, they think of a neural pill in the fly brain which has been associated with generalization, and that's the mushroom bodies. So the mushroom body was the first, um, ta uh, the first target to manipulate and to find out what would happen to our, our uh, composite uh, situation and the two components in it. Um, the mushroom bodies are paired neuropil structure in the fly brain, which are marked here in green. And you can target most of the cells in the mushroom bodies genetically to uh, switch them off. So you use a genetic little genetic tool, genetic, genetic trick to block the output from the mushroom bodies. Uh, this is basically equivalent to uh, ablating the mushroom bodies or lesion them. And then we subject them to the same uh, three basically tasks. So um, we first uh, checked for the generalization, uh, very firstly of course we checked for the, uh, the composite learning, the skill in fact together that they learn that fine and this is something that is, uh, has been shown before if you block output or ablate the mushroom bodies the flies appear to be fairly normal the only thing that these flies are impaired in terms of learning that is that is obvious and simple is olfactory classical conditioning for most other learning tasks those flies are fine now what about the other thing so the blue bar, if you remember, was the, the generalization bar. And uh, so they performed to our expectation that they, that they did not generalize. So this extends the previous findings that the mushroom bodies are somehow involved in certain cases, not all, but certain cases of generalization. Now, interesting, if you look at the skill component, which is suppressed in wild-type flies, uh, this is not suppressed in those mushroom body impaired flies. And this is not a genetic background uh, effect because the genetic controls, so the parental strains that, that are pooled here in this case, uh, they re reproduce the wild type results in that they learn the composite situation, generalize the colors to the different behavior, and they use, uh, presumably, so my interpretation is that it's the suppression of the behavior, that of the behavioral learning, of the skill learning component that enables this generalization. So what does that remind us of? It, mean, it reminds us that this is a very flexible, so I suppress behavioral learning to be flexible. And if I don't suppress behavioral learning, I become stereotyped. I keep turning even though the situation changes. So remember here, we just took the color filter out. And they just keep turning to the, behave, to the direction that they've been trained to turn. So that is reminiscent of a habit, right? You do something over and over and over again, and then you keep doing it even though it's not adaptive anymore. So what happens to me all the time is because we have to lock and unlock and lock our doors um, at work uh, constantly if we just leave the room because it's all open. I come home at night and I want to open the door to my apartment and I use my work key all the time. It's just simply this is a habit that I keep doing all the time. Um, so what if the mushroom bodies were some sort of gatekeeper, were uh, suppressing habit formation in order to, general, to enable generalization, then you would expect this sort of thing to happen if you switch them off. Conversely, if you then train and overtrain wild type animals, they should show exactly that. They should show that uh, they start learning the behavior and that should prevent the generalization. And this is exactly what we find. We actually find habit formation. If we just train wild type flies for twice the regular amount, we get a phenocopy of the flies, so we cannot distinguish them anymore from flies without mushroom bodies or with impaired mushroom bodies. So, to sum this up real quick, mushroom bodies 
appear to mediate the suppression of skill learning, of the skill learning component, in order to generalize, uh, in order to, to enable generalization. Repetition can overcome this suppression and form habits. So what does that mean in the, in the uh, red, green, and blue uh, scheme of things? It means that we have a skill learning component which facilitates fact learning. The fact learning in a reciprocal interaction uh, inhibits skill learning. Skill learning is rutabaga independent, fact learning is rutabaga dependent. The mushroom body seems seem to inhibit, uh, seem to mediate this inhibition. And what I didn't show is that we have uh, good reasons to believe that the mushroom bodies are not at all involved in the facilitation of the fact learning component. And now with this scheme, it's very straightforward what are the next things that we want to do. Uh, obviously, we want to find out um, which circuits generate this left and right turning behavior. Obviously, it's a, like I said, we have good reasons to believe that there are dedicated circuits in the brain that are uh, designed um, to produce spontaneous behavior even in the absence of any, any environmental cues and we want to find out how those work. Um, then of course if we, you then uh, train the animals then you want to find out how is that sensory feedback, how is the heat for example, how is that fed back into the circuit to modify the circuit so that the spontaneous behavior is biased towards one of the two directions. Of course since we don't know what the molecular cascades are for operant conditioning, and there's only circumstantial evidence um, as to what those components might be, or actually preliminary circumstantial evidence for other animals. Um, we want to find out uh, what those operant genes might be. Um, then what we don't know at all is where is this facilitation being processed. We know it's probably not, most likely not in the mushroom bodies. Um, where else is it? So that's one of the next questions I'd like to ask. And then, of course, how do the mushroom bodies do this inhibition? So once I found out here um, how the sensory feedback is integrated, so how this skill learning actually works, and nobody knows that. Um, once I found that out, I'd like to know how can, I, how can the mushroom bodies inhibit this sort of learning? And finally, why does that inhibition go away if I just keep training the animals? So that's basically um, the work of some, some of that I've done in my graduate thesis in Würzburg. Most of it I've done um, for the last two years in Berlin. And uh, that's the roadmap if I ever uh, get a job and a grant to be able to do that. <laughs>
mushroom bodies appear to have a very critical role in olfactory learning directly, but only have very subtle effects. And, and uh, there's, a, there's a good reason to believe that the common theme behind the rest of the functions of the mushroom body uh, is inhibitory and as a gatekeeping uh, agent, in that certain uh, stimuli and events are being uh, blocked from entering a memory template. Um, most likely, I would say, is that you have different populations. That, uh, what is known is that the mushroom bodies are not a homogeneous uh, population of neurons. There are several subpopulations, and my best bet would be that a subset of those is highly specialized for classical conditioning, uh, or olfactory conditioning, actually, only olfactory classical conditioning, whereas the rest performs other functions. Well, following up on that, I mean, could you imagine to replace your colors by odors, or is that technically infeasible? It's in principle, it's possible, but then, of course, the the combination would already wouldn't work because they don't learn the smell. So there's for the rutabaga so, ones, yeah. But no, but if you delete the mushroom bodies, if oh, you ablate the mushroom bodies, they wouldn't learn it. If it were true that the mushroom bodies, so there is a good friend of mine, he's trying to devise the heretic experiment namely an olfactory learning experiment where there's no difference between training and test, where the situations are as similar as possible. And if the heretic hypothesis is correct, then they should be able to learn uh, smells, to learn odors. Um, if you assume that uh, the mushroom, uh, a subpopulation of mushroom bodies actually is involved in olfactory learning, then of course you'd have to spare this subpopulation in the experiment you're suggesting to ablate the rest of the mushroom body and leave the leave this odor conditioning subpopulation intact, then you could do that. But you could at least do, I mean, without ablating anything, you could do the first parts of your experiment yes. again and see whether it's different for a different um, sensor or modality. Yes, right? yes, you could do it. So I've done the sit I've done the, some of these experiments in my graduate thesis with patterns. A subset of these experiments, and they with wild type flies, and they turn out fairly similar. Uh, the problem only is that if you use um, visual colors, it interferes with the choice of the fly for flight direction because they try to fly towards the patterns. So, um, and it's still visual; it's not a different modality. But I'd expect most results, in principle, to turn out the same way, if, even if I used a different sensory modality. Yes. A quick question about the memory test. Are you testing here for short term or long term memory? This is immediately after training. Immediately. So there's okay. no, this is, those are continuous. I thought that those, the, the one I showed initially were like nine bars, nine two minute bars. That's a continuous 18 minute okay. experiment. So can you speculate on any possible differences between the duration of memory for fact and skill? Just a speculation. Um, yes, well, um, for the memory, I have no clue. Um, if, if introspection and vertebrate experiments are anything to go by, then once, you've ha once you have a behavioral memory, it, it sticks. It's like riding a bike. Once you have a behavioral memory, that's, you, it's hard to get rid of. And it would make sense to suppress that sort of learning initially and uh, to only have this sort of learning occurring when you are dead sure it's not the wrong kind of thing. So what you, I mean, you can just speculate if you had, if you knew how this works in in, uh, in humans, um, and you could knock this inhibition out with a pill or, or some other manipulation, you could learn the golf swing in just a few goes because it wouldn't be inhibited anymore. But of course, if you do that uh, for the wrong behavior, you know, if if you do this with children for tying tying your laces and they, they tie a knot, they'll be stuck with tying knots in their laces for a long time. Tell me again, it's just a basic thing, why you prefer this term of fact learning and skill learning to the more you know, classical operants? Actually, the operation. classical I don't have any issues with because yeah. um, that's easy to separate and it's easy to make, to, to tell people, okay, you know, it's two stimuli that are associated, it's very easy. With the classical, I don't really have an issue with. The problem is that um, if you say operant, um, it always... The, the, the operant or instrumental learning always involves the environment. I've, I've noticed that I have a really hard time trying to explain to vertebrate people um, that 
we're looking at an operant component in isolation. They have a really hard time uh, just understanding the concept of being able to separate a component in something that they've grown up to see as a as a monolithic thing, uh, instrumental conditioning. That's you know that, that's uh, this sort of you know lever pressing rat. And um, I'm not hell bent of getting any new nomenclature actually through and, and get it official or anything. Um, at the moment, I'm only in a, in a position to try to suggest that maybe um, it's worth thinking or rethinking of, of what operant conditioning or what, what we used to know as operant conditioning, what that actually is, and that it's actually compared to classical conditioning, it's actually a more complex and composite thing that um, is very hard to look at from a monolithic perspective and where, where separating the components makes a lot more sense. It's just the term skill also has sort of connotations as well. It does. Trouble. It, it does. Um, There's a very good reason I had this one slide in there where I had active on one side, I had skill learning in the middle, and I had operant on the other side because it's, I don't really have, I mean, I'm open to suggestions if, if there's a good way of solving that without confusing a large uh, proportion of the audience, I'm, I'm, I'll take it right away. If there's a good, if there's a good solution to that nomenclature problem, I, I won't argue. <laughs> but the problem is, I see, I see benefits in, in, with all the, the possible all the possible versions of the of the nomenclature, and I have a hard. And of course, I'm not, I'm not the one who single-handedly decides nomenclature. No. So that's why. <laughs> I'm 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 having a, having trouble there. So any any suggestions on how to solve that? I'm I'm very open. Or is there a problem? Well, I mean, maybe there isn't any. I don't know. It depends. On, as you said, it depends a lot on how you grew up with with terms. For me, operant has not not necessarily the connotation that I'm operating a machine or something. And that's what what you, know, you don't like about it, right? That, that you're operating onto the environment and you're not right. just doing the skill. Right. Or, uh, I actually, honestly, personally wouldn't have that connotation, but I, so I, noticed you, I, I believe you that people do. Uh, Nick Mackintosh wrote, you know, who used to be here yes. a long time ago, oh, yeah. out the uh, right. concepts conflated in nearly all experiments on, on vertebrates mm -hmm. and artificial yes. and radio. It's, it's really, it's very complicated. Yes. Have you tried other um, classic learning memory means involved in neural cyclates for your, in your paradigm? So you Not yet. We're, we're on the way. So the circumstantial, the preliminary evidence from other animals I was referring to was actually from aplesia where they find it's a type 2 cyclase and not a type 1 cyclase as, as Ruto Vega. And uh, there's a second poster that was just now on the, on the SFN meeting um, where they show that in mice it's a type 5 um, cyclase. I don't think the homologies and orthologies are really very well mapped yet for all of the cyclases. It appears to me that at least both of those cyclases are calcium independent and uh, <coughs> appear to be dopamine dependent. Like you tried to like dance and other. Those standard ones, no. Yeah, those, like those, no, those, those we have now. The, the thing is, the, the thing is, of course, um, while it would be good to corroborate that effect with a different learning mutant, that's a good thing. I'm mostly interested now, okay, to find out, I know it's not the classical pathway. So, which other one, which other pathway is it? And it appears, again, to be a cyclase. It appears to involve PKA and PKC, if the other animals are anything to go by. Um, and it, so it might involve some of the downstream components of the cyclase pathways. And then, of course, it's not clear whether you're dealing with separate neurons or with different compartments in the same neurons. Um, but at least the cyclase le at the cyclase level, the, uh, the pathways seem to differ. And then, of course, if you have DUNS or, or amnesic or other of those uh, that are in or in the same pathway, but potentially in different locations of the pathway, we'd have to look at it. Just returning to the nomenclature, it's just a, t just a matter of, if you try to put, I think some very interesting experiments here. If you're only trying to publish this, you might get people reading it and get hung up on this yes. nomenclature and ignore the interest in the experiments. I already got 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm already got my feet. You've got your concern about something about how to define operant conditioning, which is yeah. uh, to some extent. So what I've tried now, so what I've what I've done in the first version of the paper, so I actually. I have two versions of this paper up, well, it's not a paper yet, it's, it's a manuscript. I have two versions up on Nature Proceedings. Um, and uh, one of the versions was trying to be all-inclusive, to you know say, well, this is operant and this is classical, you could call it differently. And I sort of tried to say, to keep the nomenclature constant throughout the paper, but say that, well, you know, it's none of the words I use are really all that adequate and have connotations from different experiments that might confuse the reader. And the referees hated it. <laughs> so, um, so basically, I mean, in the end they said, uh, oh yeah, the nice experiments and we don't have anything scientific to add to the experiment, but uh, it's to it's, we hate the way it's written. <laughs> and anyway. so I wrote it in a new way where there's no operant conditioning, no classical, doesn't, not a single time appears in the manuscript and I just stuck to fact learning and skill learning because I figured that's the most general thing that people can relate to even that are, that are not in the field. And now it's a, it's a test, it's an experiment and so now we'll see, we'll see how it turns out. I have, I have no idea. I just submitted it uh, yesterday. So if you want to compare. Both of those yeah, I think maybe we can take this discussion to the bar as well. If there's not any other questions, I would think it's uh, it's off to the IDS bar. Thank you for coming.